well, one thing that's loud and clear for me, Kermit, is is the fact that you you do have this collection, but it's it almost feels like it's your um, you know your number one priority is to share it with other people. Did you ever believe you would have this um, this business, this collection, this this wonderful thing to share? Because well, one thing that's loud and clear for me, Kermit, is is the fact that you you do have this collection, but it's it almost feels like it's your um, you know your number one priority is to share it with other people, you know, to allow people to have that experience that you want to offer at Fantasy of Flight to improve their lives. And, and again, just like AirAbility, you're using that as a tool for their, you know, for, to, 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 to support their their dreams and ambitions. And, and I I can vouch for the uh, the fantasy of flight experience. I, I visited there myself uh, and, and it is pretty profound. It's an awesome place to go. But tell us about that vision you had and when did it start? Well, it was interesting. When I, if, if my friends had told me what I would be doing in the future back then, I would have thrown my hands up and said, there's no way, there's no way. And so what they've done, and hopefully everyone's guidance or whatever you want, they'll only give you what you need and they'll bring you slowly, slowly this way. And all of a sudden I find myself down the road like, oh my God, I mean, I live so far outside the fringes of most people's reality that I just, I, I have to pinch myself at times. So it was, a, I didn't realize I was following the energies because at that time early on, I was being nurtured along on my path. But eventually I began, and it wasn't a blinding flash of light, it was going slowly over a hump. And I began to realize it was happening. And eventually I began to learn to connect in ways that became very, very manifest, you know, became more of a way of life. And that's developed. Uh, and now I, I literally, I sit down every day and I'm talking to my friends and, and I get all sorts of fascinating information. And like I said, the collection is just an aspect of Kermit Weeks. It's not my whole life. And what's going to happen here is, is part of what I'm creating and I've been led to create is to stand on Walt Disney's shoulders and what he left me, okay? And literally created an entirely new industry. If you go back and bear with me, I would, uh, I would uh, put on the table that imagine the traveling gypsy bands going around entertaining, blah, 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 okay? Well, at some point that evolves into a giant Barnum and Bailey Ringling Brothers Circus, okay? And now that's the greatest freaking thing that's happening. But the circus only came to town so many times and then people started thinking, well, what can we do to where we can, you know, have something all the time? And so out of the evolution of the circus came the amusement park industry. Coney Island, Palisades Park, okay? Now we got Ferris wheels, wooden roller coasters, tunnel of love, bumper cars, okay? And, you know, all sorts of games and stuff. So that became the next industry. And by the way, the circus is now defunct after 146 years. There's cycles in every industry. And basically in 1955, Walt was at the amusement park uh, convention in Chicago. He laid out his plans for Disneyland. They all said he's crazy. You're going to lose your tail. They're either irrelevant or they're out of business. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. you're seeing the beginning of the demise of the existing industry that Walt started and pendulum swing in society. You have to understand what Walt Segway was. Walt Segway was in America. We had just come out of World War II and Korea, and we didn't have to deal with the aftermath of the cleanup. We came home to our time. The women were in the workforce, 2.3 kids. We got a great interstate system to take our campers around Americans and not look at devastation. And it was leave it to beaver time. That was Walt's segue. And so Mickey Mouse, wow, and all this stuff, we were looking to escape from reality. Well, now 
reality is staring us in the face and we're going to have to deal with it. Okay. So what I'm going to do is stand on Walt's shoulders and create the next industry. But it's not about entertainment as an end product. The existing industry uses entertainment as a means to entertain you. And they basically focus on external spectacularism. Okay. Which mm -hmm. is, uh, which is great. It's fun. Oh my God. It's, they've developed it to the nth degree using amazing technology and stuff. What I want to do is I want to create something instead of, uh, you know, you're on a roller coaster with 49 other people and it's a five minute whoopie do experience. And like, Oh, let's get back in line again. Where's the next one? Because you eat it like popcorn. What yeah. I want to do is I want to create things to use entertainment as a means to an end to your own self-discovery and self-transformation, you walk into my theme park, one person, there's a sign outside that says, warning, once you step beyond these gates, you may not leave the same person, okay? You basically go in, we don't tell you anything. We, everything we have is common to the human experience. There's no value system doing something new, accepting limitations that others place upon you, things like that. We'll use aviation stories to deliver that, that were real, because everything I'm going to deliver is based on things that are real, where I would say the existing industry basically is not. Okay. Yeah. And so our mission statement is to light that spark within, which is you bringing what you truly are into this reality of light and expressing it in your own unique way, you change yourself inside. You leave a different person and nobody knows what went on. If I can deliver that, I'm onto something really, really big. And I think you're going to see the planet is going to be ready for something like that. Uh, you're going to be seeing, uh, a little bit of the waning of the existing industry. And I think when I finally come out with this, everybody's going to go, oh my God, this is so obvious. Why didn't somebody think of this? And the world's going to be ready for it. So, so instead mm -hmm. of, you know, going to the current theme park industry and being a hero in their intellectual property, I want you to come to fantasy of flight. There's a reverse deal as a wellspring source of your own self-inspiration. And when you leave, there's going to be a sign that says, and for anybody that's been a fantasy of flight, you've always noticed why my welcome mats face out the door. It's always been that way since day one. You're going to see a sign that says, welcoming you to becoming the greatest hero you can be in the greatest story you can ever participate in. You. Yeah, no, that, that, that sounds really exciting, Kim. It, it, it really does. And that sounds like um, something that, um, you know, we'll we'll learn more about in, in the coming months uh, and, and years as, as you, you know, as you bring that to reality for people to actually experience. So I'm um, very, very excited to hear about that. And I can I can tell you. And John, can, John just re just really quickly, um, you know, for the, the airplane enthusiasts, I'm going to create something that is going to blow away the airplane enthusiast. Nobody is going to do what I'm going to do. So they are going to be very, very happy. Uh, you're still going to see airplanes, still going to fly, blah, blah, rides and things like that. But it's going to be delivered in a way that the general public is going to come and they're going to go, oh, my God, this is the greatest freaking product since sliced bread. Oh, and by the way, those airplanes are actually pretty cool. So I'm kind of creating a win-win situation where the non-aviation enthusiast is going to leave with a better uh, and a broader, uh, you know, appreciation for what aviation can mean metaphorically. Yeah. And potentially, like I said, instead of this many people like an old airplanes, maybe we get a, a smaller piece of the biggest freaking pie, which is seven and a half billion people. Yeah. 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 Wow. Well, wow. I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready to hear more. That that sounds really, really fascinating. And and Mike and I were just about to burst into conversation about our views on our uh, experience at Fantasy of Flight. So I, I think I said to you a couple of days ago, Kermit. You know, I um I asked my wife to marry me two days before I visited Fantasy of Flight, and she's still here. Uh, and then <laughs> I, I hope that wasn't the honeymoon. <laughs> no, it wasn't. Well, I. 
I would have loved to have made it my honeymoon, and I and I purchased this in the gift shop. Um, right. And uh, I I highly recommend it to everybody listening. Um, I four head west towards Tampa, and do not do not pass Fantasy of Flight because if you do, you'll be very disappointed. Um, but uh, if if I could focus a little bit, um, you talked about the enthusiasts and and the the airheads. Um, so, I, you know, where do we start? Um, I'm not going to ask your favorite airplane. I'm not going to ask you the one that you'll sell last if you had to. Um, but can you, for those of us watching who haven't been to Fantasy of Flight, Kermit, from an a aircraft perspective, you know, when you walk in, what do you see? I mean, you, you, if I'm not mistaken, your earliest aircraft is 1913. Your most recent aircraft is a 1956. You've got 140 plus aircraft in the collection, all of which... Uh, have either flown, do fly, or will be flying. You you must have a team of restorers and mechanics. You know, I mean, just put us in there. Put us well, in there. Put in the life of. Well, it's interesting. I mean, obviously, I was my first employee, and I was my first mechanic, and uh, you know, built and all that stuff. And at the the, the Weeks Air Museum. Uh, for people that haven't looked at some of my, and please everybody, check out KermitWeeks.com. I got a YouTube channel that's got tons of great, cool videos checking out in World War One airplanes and P-51s and stuff. I've also got a Facebook deal. What I realized was, and I use as a metaphor, all great stories come in three acts, okay? And, and the Weeks Air Museum in Miami opened in 1985. And that was the beginning of Act One, and it closed with Hurricane Andrew, August 24th, 1992. Fantasy of Flight opened in 1995, so like uh, three years later. And uh, that was basically Act Two. I closed Act Two in 2014. So the, ex the facility that you would have come to with the restaurant and the Art Deco and all that stuff, that is currently closed to the public. I lost my butt for so 18 and a half years. And we tried for a year by cutting costs down, cutting the staff down, cutting our hours down. And about nine months into that year, the writing was on the wall. And I said, look, I need to shut this down. I would rather take the money I'm losing, which was a lot, and put it towards the development of what I now understand I'm supposed to be creating. So I shut the doors in 2014, but then a year later I realized, you know, hey guys, I still have a lot of trademarks. I've got uh, a sign out on the interstate that I don't really want to lose. I needed to have a gift shop open to maintain my trademark status uh, because I've got all these trademarks that I've got for the future concept. So we opened, we had a little hanger across the way. So right now I've got a little boring museum light that's signs, ropes, a few kiosks. <laughs> you got to realize the, the facility that was the original fantasy of flight was only originally ever designed to be my shop. This is Fantasy of Flight, the original facility where my office and the two hangars and the restaurant were, and two other buildings and eventually a, a, a third one, <coughs> a fourth one, is going to be literally my dream restoration and maintenance facility. Okay, so we've shut down that. We're turning, like this hangar is going to be my restoration hangar. And, uh, you know, we're turning this eventually into the dream shop restoration thing. And where people used to come in the arched gate entrance, which was always the entrance, there's a big open field. Why, why was the entrance always there? Because that open field is what I've always intended, where I've intended Fantasy of Flight to be. And so that, what I'm telling everybody is Act 2 closed in 2014. Oh, yeah, we got this little museum light thing, whatever. You know, yeah, you can see a few airplanes. And it's really to keep the aviation enthusiasts happy a little bit. But in reality, it wouldn't be open, except I got to have my gift shop open to maintain my trademarks. And we've been working on the design and development of Act 3. Uh, and I'm telling everybody, go take a bathroom break, get a hot dog and a Coke. Act 3 is going to be in at some point. And I know I get some people out there on my Facebook page say, ah, it's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. Well, they've obviously given up on it, but I can assure you I have not. I've been working on this for a very long time. I've got a lot invested in this. It's not just the airplanes. There's a long-term goal and dream of which the airplanes and stuff are a part of. And, yeah, yeah I own 140 airplanes. 
But there's also a not-for-profit that owns about two dozen airplanes, most of which I've donated. So there's over 165 airplanes in the collection. And at some point, I see once I can create a product, a viable product that can generate income, that part of that income goes towards the collection, all of the collection is going to end up in the not-for-profit. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. One, one thing in, in terms of the, the real estate, one thing i got to get out of the open right now, why all Ampa? It's fascinating. And and I I tell you what, put put the license plate back up there for a second. Yep. Okay. I've trademarked stuff over the years, and I realized I needed a trademark for Fantasy of Flight. And I trademarked my tagline, an attraction on a higher plane, way, way years before I understood what it meant. It's a it's a it's a play on words. Yeah. Not only is it a tourist attraction on a higher airplane, in other words, a higher standard within the industry, but it's literally you saying, come this way. It's your higher self leading you beyond yourself. And, and you, you put that down now, but basically how where the Orlampa thing came into, I when I left Miami looking for property, before I ever opened the Weeks Air Museum in 1985, I was looking for property in Central Florida because I realized, oh, my God, I outgrew the collection before I ever opened the doors. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm not going to go through five years of permitting with an, with an airport authority, and I don't even own the building. I need to go to Central Florida where the tourist industry is. So I started looking for land and I had three uh, requirements, which I didn't real at the, realize at the time, but my friends had dumped into my head. The first one was I needed great tourist access, which I've got. OK, the second one was a 5000 foot runway to get my heavier and faster airplanes in. And the third thing was water access to fly vintage seaplanes in their natural environment. I know of no museum on the planet where they have a vintage airplane museum and they fly seaplanes. Yeah. And so, yeah, so this view right there is actually looking from potentially what's going to be the top of a control tower. And I'm explaining that area down behind me there. And the seaplane base will be behind me there with the lake. Yeah, well, that's the end of my short runway. But that whole open area there is basically where Act Three is going to be, and that's what we're working on the design now. So our Lampa, I didn't realize it, but I realized at some point I was exactly forty minutes to the doorstep of the Tampa and the Orlando airport. Okay, and it was interesting. I purchased a piece of property for something. Told me to collect some property. I've been collecting property myself for 30 years now, okay? And people don't really realize how much property I've got, but I've got more than what Universal started with when they originally started in Orlando, okay? And uh, it's gonna blow some people away at some point uh, with, the, with the potential, it's potential, you know, but I've, we're, we've master planned kind of the bigger picture. Um, and so the Orlampa deal, when we bought this piece of property, I thought, well, yeah, you know, we could put, put it was kind of over on the corner where you got off. And I'm going, yeah, we could put a McDonald's in and make a bunch of money in short term, this and that. And by this time, you know, I'm talking to my friends and they said, yeah, well, you could do that. But, you know, there might be some reason why you want to, you know, save it for later or something. You know, they never tell me what to do. They always lay out options and I follow those energies and I've never been wrong. And it was interesting, the realtor, we were talking about this. He said, what we ought to do is we ought to come up with a name that defines the location. And my focus went like that. And I want to explain a little bit of a metaphor here for people to, to begin to learn to trust this connecting through the strings deal. John, if you and I walk into a party and there's 100 people there and 50 conversations, Conversations. When we walk into that party, it's just white noise. Okay. It's mm -hmm. just white noise. Well, guess what? Life is white noise. We listen to everything. So, what are we supposed to listen to? Okay. And this is the effect that you're looking for that I know you've, everyone out there has had this experience, but begin to focus and work on this because it's just you saying, come this way. You and I are standing there. We're thinking, 
you know, who do I know here? Where's the bar? Where's the bathroom? Whatever. And all of a sudden, somebody on the far side of the room mentions John. Your focus goes, whoo. Doesn't even phase me. It's not in my world. You're in phase with that. You're in resonance with that. And when things happen spontaneously and you go, it's life getting saying, pay attention to this, okay? So each of you out there, begin to play with this and learn how to work with it because it's just you working with you. So with your Lampa deal, I thought about that and my focus was like, why am I supposed to pay attention to that? Eventually, it evolved into Orlampa, okay, which is exactly halfway between Tampa and Orlando. It just happens to be seven letters. And I did not discover, I trademarked it for theme park services, land development, blah, 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 clothing and stuff. A long time ago, coined the phrase, I didn't realize till later, and I'm not going to get into it now, there is so much meaning in that, that word that it blew me away later, and it ties in with the same thing like an attraction on a higher plane. When I trademarked it, it was given to me, but I didn't understand what it meant until five or six years later. And it was the same thing with Orlampa. This whole Fantasy Applied Fry project, including the mission statement and everything, was eventually, it was just given to me, I say from my friends or whatever, but it's coming from somewhere and it keeps working for me. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's incredible. And, and you know, I, um, I think that in terms of location and accessibility, uh, it doesn't get much better, uh, um, you know, in, in, in terms of getting in by air or by by road. And, and um, you know, I think uh, you've, you've absolutely got to follow your, you know, where the direction you need to go. And, and um, in terms of the in terms of the aircraft that are there, um, I know you and I had a brief chat before we went live. And, um, you know, I uh, I think we'll be here till friday afternoon if we speak about every single one of your airplanes but i know you love british airplanes but in i think was it 94 uh you you bought the sunderland but uh but that's okay because you kept it flying i'm sure i'm sure if it stayed in the uk it it probably would have not uh, ended up flying and stayed in a museum somewhere so uh are we flying it now no i've kind of been there done that but what's going to happen is in the future fantasy of flight is all about potential and all my airplanes, they may not all fly right now, but they all have potential to re be rebuilt, to fly at some point, but not just to fly them because Kermit wants to go fly it. And everybody gets to read in an airplane magazine. Kermit spent millions of dollars to see a picture in an airplane magazine of it flying. You know, no, I've been there, done that. I'm trying to create a sustainable business that will perpetuate this uh Maybe not for you to see it fly again, but maybe for your grandkid to see it fly again. Okay. You know, yeah. I mean, I, I expect it'll fly again in my lifetime. Maybe, maybe not, but you know, but the potential is going to be there and I'm trying to lay that foundation now. So, you know, I think we all tend to live in a society that we want everything right now. We just keep popping popcorn in our deal. And, you know, saying things that really have value and meaning take time to bring into this reality. And that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah, absolutely.